What's up, guys? So welcome to the July Tidal Gardens live show. Hope everyone's having a, a pretty good weekend so far. I don't know what the temperature is like over where you live, but here it's we're in some kind of heat wave, I think, where it's something in like the 90s or high 80s, low 90s, and we've been here for a couple weeks and we probably have a couple weeks more to go. So, got to hydrate, right? So, how's everyone doing? We are here a little bit early. Typically, I like to start the show about 10 to 15 minutes early just to make sure that the audio and everything is working. It looks like it is. So, let's see. In chat, if you can't hear me for some reason, um, just let me know. But I think it should be working. I'm looking at my audio meters and whatnot, and everything seems fine. So hopefully that goes without a hitch. So as far as what is going on here, not this well, not this next weekend, but the weekend after July 27th, we're having our second annual Tidal Gardens barbecue and it's shaping up to be a pretty large number of people showing up. If I had to guess, I would say that we're expecting something in the ballpark of 120 people, conservatively estimated. And you can kind of see uh, in the screen behind me there kind of what the, the venue is going to be. Uh, we have like this kind of red barn that we use for entertaining. That'll be like the main outdoor space. Here it is at night. Obviously the the, sh the barbecue is gonna go from noon to 12, or noon to 6 p.m. So there's not gonna be any kind of like lighting like this. That and we also took it down a couple years ago. So doubly so, you're not gonna see lighting like that. But it is, substantially improved also from when this video was shot. So there's definitely some stuff to see there. We're probably gonna be serving all the food in that area. There's obviously also the greenhouse where people can check out coral. And there's gonna be the new building as well where you can see the studio where this is all shot. See how, uh, how far along in the, pro in the process of building that building we are. And theoretically there should be aquariums there but there's almost no chance that those aquariums will be full of water, unfortunately, because delays upon delays upon delays, those tanks will be arriving very um, late in the process. So we'll only have them for like a couple days before the barbecue event even starts. So I kind of have an idea to, to, to showcase them, but unfortunately, there's not, they're not gonna be full of water. And even if they were full of water, I don't know if it's a great idea for us to put corals into them. You know, two days, throwing in Acropora, probably not the best idea. Oh, man. So yeah, this, this whole month of July has been insanely busy. We've done this live show. Uh, I've done two different entertaining events already. So my parents had a big get-together for the Burmese community. I had a bunch of friends from high school one weekend and, and, their, ch and their kids. Um, we've done a whole bunch of other stuff to kind of prepare for those events and everything like that here. And then next week, I'm entertaining another group of friends from like college age. And then the weekend after that is the big barbecue. So I'm like just trying to, oh, and uh, we have to actually get the aquariums in from Reef Savvy. And that is gonna be a, a whole day affair, I'm sure, because we're getting our first five aquariums. And each one of those aquariums is over 10 feet long. It's gonna be it's gonna be pretty busy from, from this point. So I'm I'm just trying to like make it to the end of July. And it's all first world problem stuff. I mean, I, I get it like, oh, you're so busy entertaining, but now it's for somebody that's kind of like introverted like me, that's like very draining, even though it's a good time. It's very draining. So but at the same time, I'm looking forward to all of it. So it should be a good, good, good event. 
All right, let's see. What do we have for comments? Tech your talk. I'm 30 seconds away from your place at the pet hospital. Awesome that you're here. Sucks about the about the pet hospital part. Which which dog is it this time? Uh, Robert Woods is asking, how much is shipping? So shipping is a flat rate, thirty nine ninety nine, and it's free over two fifty. Once we start into the coral selling portion of the show, you'll see some pop up overlays every now and again that kind of illustrates that. So. Uh, you'll kind of get the picture. Also, if you want to kind of be preemptive about that for anybody else that's kind of curious as to how one of these live shows works, just go over to titlegardens.com slash live and there you will see the numbered list of all the corals. Hopefully, otherwise this is gonna be a very short live show. Let me double, triple check to make sure that's the case. It is, okay. And there's a big link there for the live sale FAQ, which kind of goes over how one of these shows works. Talk about shipping, talk about um, about just how to place the orders. So you kind of check out with the item number. So if you like item number five, for example, there is a, a number five. In this case, it is $35. And we'll show what that coral is on the screen behind me once we get to that point. And then you Put it into your shopping cart and check out just like normal. Lucas B. Watching a hurricane outside from Louisiana. Corals are more fun. Yeah, I was watching Rico's live stream. He went on vacation and is seeing a lot of gray weather with a lot of big waves. Great timing. Intro to reefing. Are you upping your coral stock a lot once you get the aquarium set up or are you just growing out what you already have or both? Both. Um, once we just get the first five aquariums, although we're not doubling the number of gallons that we we're going to have, it's going to be double the productivity. So essentially, right now we have in the greenhouse facility 5,000 gallons, but every gallon isn't equal to another gallon. So there's like good gallons and then there's kind of like waste, what I'll call wasted gallons. And so this new uh, first set that we're gonna be building in the new, in the new building is 2,000 gallons. So a little less than half of what is going on next door at the greenhouse. But almost all of it is like prime real estate good gallons. So when you compare kind of the, the good gallons to good gallons between the 2,000 versus the 5,000, the 2,000 might actually be more productive. So we're going to be growing out a lot more there. And pretty much everything that we acquire new, so whether it be stuff that got imported, meaning only Australia right about now, uh, or if we get new frags from people or we take in rescues and stuff like that, all of that has to go through the greenhouse first, go through all of our kind of our cleanup procedure there as best as we can, kind of get picked over by the fish and other inverts to kind of clean that up. And then we, we definitely want to kind of, kind of funnel everything through the greenhouse systems before they make it into the, the new building. We're trying to make it a little bit cleaner here. It's going to be tough either way when, whenever you scale up, but that's kind of the idea there. Adam Moore, Title Gardens, best in the business. I appreciate it, Adam. Thank you. Uh, Nathan Cathy, what do you do for backup power? In the past, we've done natural gas generators. And so for this new building, um, that's still the, the plan. It's a little bit more complicated in this building because we're running 400 amp three phase. And three phase plus natural gas generators is a little bit weird. So we might have to get a little bit creative on that. And unfortunately, when it comes to plumbing, I'm super comfortable talking about plumbing. When it comes to electrical, I am a total fish out of water. I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. But from everything that I've read, it's more of a challenge to do backup power generation for three-phase systems. 
and also our 400 amp is also broken up in between like two different uh, sub panels, 200 amps a piece. That also adds complexity as far as wiring goes. So I'm like, when the time comes, I'll get a good electrician, hopefully, to, to work on that. Harkins says, sumps are, are wasted gallons. Uh, to some degree, yes. To some degree, no. I was thinking more along the lines of sometimes people build their actual aquariums in such a way that they're really only using uh, the, the, the surface area portion of it. So they'll have all of their corals on like a big sheet, but then their tanks are very deep. So you have really only about like eight inches before you get to the corals, and then another two feet below the corals, let's say. Well, those two feet of, of volume is a huge amount of volume. But what that's doing for you in the way of providing space for aquaculture really isn't that much. I mean, you could have taken that 24 inches and spread that over like three different systems, same amount of volume, triple the productivity, if you understand where I'm going with that. Let's see. Angel or Angel, what is your opinion about T5 LED hybrid fixtures for a reef tank? Arguably, that is the best route. It's kind of, um, you're kind of getting the best of all worlds at that point. I really, really, really like T5. And a lot of like the newer LED fixtures are making huge strides. And I know, for, for example, uh, People are really happy with the Gen 4 Radeon Pros, for example. And we're actually going to be going with that for our first 10 aquariums. Honestly, it's probably going to be for all the aquariums here. Uh, but we just haven't purchased all the other aquariums yet. But a lot of it is you know, because of space and energy savings and heat related to, to T5. So we're going to try the, the whole LED route here in the new building. Other place we're still using primarily um, T5. I don't know if I just crossed those up. So we're doing LED in the new building and we're doing T5 still at the old one. Okay, uh, it is two o'clock officially, so let's get going on this live show portion. Okay. So like the little overlay there says, if you want to actually purchase coral and you're in the US, not in Hawaii. Uh, you can go over to titlegardens.com and titlegardens.com slash live will take you to the live, sh live sale page. So some people were asking uh, about what's, what's the deal with like the color temp and all that. So I'm trying to illustrate what it looks like under different types of lighting. And this is kind of like a special effect that I do. It's not, unfortunately, in the camera. That would be not impossible, but really challenging. So I'm kind of doing this as a special effect to show something more daylight-ish at about 6,500 Kelvin, all the way up to something that's almost purely a, I would say, a blue plus look. If you're familiar with an ATI blue plus, we're still not going to be able to get like the really crazy all blue LED look. Um, that's something that's very challenging to capture, but you can kind of get an idea of the transition going from more of a daylight look to more of an actinic look. Let's see, uh, Becky, can we purchase today and pick up at the barbecue? Uh, we could probably do that. I mean, two weeks is a little bit far out, but we've done that before, so that's entirely possible. Honestly, Becky, uh, if you're coming to the barbecue, you might see a lot more stuff, because even though we're going over roughly 180 pieces of coral right now, that's like nothing <laughs> as far as coming to the greenhouse. I mean, we, as far as our website is concerned, as far as what you see in these live shows, um, you're going to see so much more. It's, it's, we only maybe have at most 5% 
on these live shows or like just the varieties like five percent of the varieties so yeah you, you might you might be you might be surprised Lucas B, you're the Bob Ross of corals. There's a happy little A can over here, happy little Philly over there. I don't know, Lucas, have you seen my last video about coral aggression? It's more like everything is trying to kill each other here. I'm just trying to put on a on a brave face about it. It's like, oh, we lost another 10 corals this morning because they all fought, that sort of thing. Mike Howard says that he likes the Gen 4 Pros. It was, I mean, I think a lot of like hobbyists would like it, but I'm more surprised that a lot of aquaculture facilities seem to like it a lot also. So I know that uh, like some of the bigger players in town, plus some big players that you might not even know the name of that are on the wholesale side of things, they've switched to the, the Gen 4 Radeon Pros and they've been very happy with it. Also, um, just like just higher end cost no objects type uh, hobbyists have gone to them and they were like so the one I'm thinking of in particular is Ryan the guy that that, that I met down in Dallas that he has that 1000 gallon system and he's kind of in the same boat as me in the sense that we've been doing this hobby for a really long time and uh, you know when you grow up in the era of 400 watt metal halides is kind of the gold standard it just has all these other drawbacks in terms of heat and electrical usage that, you know, for someone like that, he's going to get the best lighting imaginable because he probably doesn't care about some of those issues. But he went with the Gen 4 Pros and he says that they're amazing and he's been blown away by their color and, and the growth rate in his coral. So I'm like, I'm going to give it a try. So we've purchased enough units for the first 10 aquariums downstairs. It was a lot of money. <laughs> it was a lot of money. So anything you guys can help out with, if you want to buy yourself some Rastas, for example, now's the time, right? Um, let's see. What is up, everyone? Rico, hello, everyone. Rico's still on vacation, I think. So he's taking time out of his hurricane-swept trip to Florida to say hello and come hang out. Uh, skeleton Boy, and I apologize, I'm way behind in chat. What camera do you guys use to film your videos? So it's the, it's the camera that's pointed at me right now. It's a Canon C200. Not the last video I did, which was on coral aggression, but one previous to that was all about my camera and production gear. Uh, it got very few views because this isn't a camera channel, and YouTube does not like it when you do off-topic things. But if you do uh, want to like look around my, my channel page, it was one of my more recent uh, videos talking all about the audiovisual side of the production here. Harkin says, the greenhouse will blow your mind. It did mine. I appreciate it, Harkin. So the greenhouse is kind of funny. Uh, for years, I would say even close to a decade, it was the big greenhouse. Um, and people come in, they, they've never seen anything that, like, that's so big that had all these corals in it. But now, in the past two years that we've done this new construction, this new building literally towers over the greenhouse. It's twice the height, it's over double the length, it's gigantic. And now it's the little greenhouse and the big new building. <laughs> it's, it, I guess it's all a matter of perspective, right? The, this, the, the greenhouse for the longest time was the big coral greenhouse. And now it's like, it looks like some little hobbyist construction. Not like reef aquarium hobbyist, I mean like, it was it's like a toy set hobbyist oh then thank you diacanthus you you hooked them up with the uh, with the link sar cat is going to do some some beginner coral soon definitely check out some of my videos on beginner corals i think i did a soft coral beginner one i did a 
large polyp stony beginner uh, coral list. Might want to check those out. So tattooed dancer 91, when fragging Favia and Favides, how important, it, how important is it to avoid damaging the polyps? Can they regrow or do they rot away from the damage? Um, it's not that important. I know that some people, they they have the, the band saws and they try to kind of like go in between every single polyp. It's a good practice, but practically speaking, you can go right through the middle of a polyp and it will likely heal. Kai Helgi Hovland. I'm absolutely certain I just butchered your name. I apologize. Thank you so much for the for the 50 of something. <laughs> where 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 are you from? Where are you from? I I have an idea of where you might be from, but I'm not quite sure. Educational as all your live shows and videos. Thank you. ATF in the house. What is up? What's the group of corals offered up for today? Today is the, so for July, this is the only live show that we're going to be doing. So it's going to be a mix of everything. We've gone over some zoas so far. We've now hopped into some of the large polyp stonies, but it's kind of like a grab bag mix. And we've kind of broken it up over the course of the show. So we're going to get back into zoas later. You get the picture. Adam is asking, how many folks do you employ at Tidal Gardens? So there's currently two people on the payroll, myself and one full-time person. And I pay that person way more than I pay myself. But a lot of my, a lot of my bills, like, re like everyday expense sort of things, it's kind of covered by the business. Um, I don't really do a whole lot outside of the business. So like a lot of my spending that I would have done would have been kind of geared towards business stuff anyway. So we just do that through the company. So I basically have, uh, how best to describe it? I pay myself enough to cover some basic utilities and food. Let's see. So Greg Reefboy is asking, how do you find people uh, who work for you, fellow hobbyists? Uh, that's a really good question. It is extremely, extremely challenging to find good people to work. And I think, um, I think everybody in the industry is having that problem, <laughs> straight up. It's, it's, it's so difficult. I don't, I don't have a good method for it. Uh, sometimes you do try some people out, they don't work out. And sometimes um, you find people, they do work out, but for some reason or another, uh, you know, they, they transition away. It, it all depends. I do have somebody in mind that I would like to hire at the end of this year. Norway. Norway. Okay. Very cool, Kai. Thank you so much. So Sarkat is asking, are these corals only for sale on the stream? So the corals will be available for about 72 hours. Right around Wednesday-ish is probably when uh, we will be deactivating the items. So if you wanted to think it over for a day, you can, we can rewatch this entire broadcast and, and see what's remaining. Sometimes, I mean, we're in basically the middle of summer. So the activity during the summer months is slower. Now, I point that out because for some of these corals, they disappear really fast. Um, like this ultra marbled favia, for example. I don't know when it, it, it will sell in the summertime here. Like I said, summertime is typically slower. But in the winter, uh, some of like the higher end pieces, they might disappear um, like really fast, like within a couple minutes. So there are some drawbacks to shopping the next day, but uh, it, it all, it all kind of depends on 
on you know how many people are participating and what they're doing with their aquariums. A lot of times in the summertime, people tend to pull back a little bit from the hobby. There's some stuff going on outside, taking their kids to soccer or whatever. So, and maybe you have to mow the, mow the grass, right? So oftentimes in the summertime, uh, people tend to neglect their reefs. Whereas like in the winter, everybody's like, well, most people in the United States anyways are stuck inside and they're either watching television or watching their fish tank. And it's like, now's the time to, to go into it. Blue Basin, if I was closer, I will work for you. I'll appreciate it. So I was also looking at the possibility of doing college interns. Uh, I had some friends over from basically high school, and one of them is a professor at Michigan State, and another one is an independent filmmaker that does a lot of work with um, the University of Akron here with their... Um, with their film department. And so they were giving me all kinds of pointers on finding uh, like good interns to have and, and the best way to manage them. So for the longest time, I've wanted to do the whole intern thing, but we really weren't well situated for it because I only had the greenhouse and my house. So it wasn't exactly like a professional setting to have students come and work here. But now that we've got this new building, once we're done with the construction aspect of it, I'll go into, um, you know, we can build out some office -y spaces for them. And so, uh, so for that, it's gonna be more on the, the digital media side of things. But my mom is also pushing hard for like biology interns to do um, some aquaculture research aspect-y things. <laughs> Aquaculture, that's a great word. Highly technical. OK Ken is asking, hey Than, do you think there will be any problems with calcium being too high over 500 parts per million? 500 is high. It's probably not going to cause any problems per se. If you were in the 600 range, I'd feel a little bit more concerned. Calcium typically doesn't by itself manifests in, in problems. But what tends to be more of an issue is that calcium can throw off something else. So oftentimes a super high calcium level comes with a super low alkalinity level, and that could be a problem. So not ideal. But then again, you know, what does your tank look like? If, if things are doing well, I wouldn't be in a huge hurry to make any kind of drastic changes. Know, perhaps just upping the amount of water changes and hopefully the the new water that you're making isn't super high in calcium and over time we'll just kind of like taper it down slowly oh, let's see. your face your facial looks so fluffy like a cans I don't even know what you mean. Uh, so Sarkat is, why do you sell more during the winter, do you think? It's a very seasonal hobby. It always has been. I think a lot of it is just attention. Um, in the summertime, there's a lot more things drawing attention away from your aquarium. So Tyler is asking, I have a Montipora cap that's not plating, but has an encrusting in my tank. Will it begin plating? Uh, hmm. So sometimes Tyler, what gets called a Montipora cap pretty much applies to any kind of orange Montipora that kind of looks like that. I've seen several different variants of it and some uh, you would swear is a plating one until it starts to grow and it's mostly encrusting. You might have run into one of those varieties. So let's see. Adam is asking, what's the highest temp your tanks run at generally? Um, so 
we try to get them down towards like 78 to be the highest temperature. But right now it's 90 degrees outside. It'll be 90. It's It's been 90 for two weeks already. It's going to be 90 for another two weeks outside. So anytime that we can keep it under 80 degrees is a victory. The times where it creeps to 81 is usually when I start kind of getting a little bit more stressed out about the situation. But it takes like several different technologies for us to even keep it down that low because you know a greenhouse magnifies temperature to a large degree. Is the building going to be open to the public ever? No. We are primarily online and we like it that way. Autocorrect, Favia. Yeah, that makes more sense. Adam Moore, are you guys starting to obsess um, over, I'm going to guess over pH yet? Will all the new testing done enhancing growth rates um, at pHs of 8.3 plus? Uh, no, I'm not going to worry about that because that's not something that we can even control. At least not at the greenhouse. The greenhouse is an open air building and as such, our pH is always going to be high. Like the, the, the gas exchange is 100% gas exchange every five minutes. Five, it might be every one minute. We're getting 100% new air through that place, especially in the summertime. So, you know, we simply don't have any pH issues. It's like, like it's one of those things that it, it is as consistent as, you know, the foundation. It's, it'll never change. So as far as mixing corals, so Sarcat, you might want to check out the um, the top five, like kind of the easy soft corals, the top five easy LPS coral video that we did, as well as the coral aggression video. Um, you can kind of gain some insight with that as to like what you can expect. Um, all corals to some degree will fight each other, so you kind of have to uh, make some concessions as far as like placement or perhaps some more chemical filtration things like that but it's outlined a lot in the coral aggression video but yeah I, I don't think that you're gonna have too too much trouble with the ones that you're looking at Nicole is asking she has a purple flower pot green eyes doesn't seem to be doing well um, the Acropora is doing great. Any thoughts on the issue? That's a toughie because certain... Um, so Ganyapora for the, the longest time have had really poor reputations for survival. However, a lot of the ones coming out of Australia tend to be... Uh, tend to be a lot, I guess, more more rugged. A little, little bit more hardy. Now, once they start to collapse in like that, what what I always wonder is if there's something bothering it, not necessarily something picking at it, but oftentimes like at the base, there's other little inverts and stuff like that that like to live in and around those types of corals. So whether that be like a spaghetti worm or like a, a feather duster or something like that, just kind of living right at the base could be uh, like part of the problem. As far as pests go, I know that there's some that have uh, like flatworm issues. So if you happen to see like kind of like a brown splotch on it, that could be just a flatworm, like a parasitic flatworm. Only other thing that I might be looking at is if, if there's any other coral perhaps stinging it, like a sweeper tentacle or something like that. Um, any other things that could possibly be the issue? I mean, when it comes to Ganyapora, I guess any number of things could be the issue. Could be too much light, could be not enough flow, could be too much flow, it kind of depends. Tattoo dancer, it's it's the reverse for me. Hay fever, summer spent indoors, 
Nice, just bought some Orphic LEDs. Nice. Yeah, so at some point I kind of did the flip. I went from liking summer and hating winter to now really liking winter and hating the summer. So my, my problem with the summer besides the heat, the slower sales, like basically everything is wrong with the summer. Mosquitoes, I'm not really down with mosquitoes. Um, not really down with every time I open the door, all these flies end up in my house and keep me awake at night until my cats catch them and eat them. Like there's just all kinds of issues with summer that I have. Oh, mowing the grass, I'm kind of done with that. Yeah. But winter's great. Uh, War Chicken, are you gonna have a show tank in the new building? I will. Uh, there's actually going to be two different show tanks. Each of them are gonna be roughly 625 gallons. And I'll be getting my first one, uh, possibly on the 18th, more likely on the 22nd. Greg Reef Boy, do you have any bubble tips in your tanks? Uh, I do. I have, um, yeah, we, we try to kind of consolidate them all into one aquarium, but yeah, we have some bubble tips. And uh, thanks again to Acanthus Reef for throwing those links in there. I think that'll be really helpful for the for the people that are kind of looking for some easier choices as well as you know just some just some background as far as um, like potential conflicts corals might have. Uh, Sutsa Madori ninety seven. If you could give a beginner one important advice, what would it be? Uh, my advice to any beginner in this hobby would be to take it really slow and do as much research as possible in that slowness. I think a, a lot of people are in a huge hurry to get going in the hobby because they're very excited, they want to jump into it. But this is not one of those hobbies that rewards uh, speed or impatience. Um, you'll almost be much better off delaying stuff and delaying stuff and delaying stuff over the course of like a year to really learn stuff and to make sure you get what you really, really want rather than buying something that's suboptimal and then replacing it later. Because there's also some degrees of suboptimal. So there is suboptimal that, oh, it's not exactly what you wanted, but it was what you could afford at the time. But there's also suboptimal and that it just simply does not keep animals alive. So you definitely want to avoid both of those situations, but there are instances of people leaping into, um, into the hobby, buying the wrong stuff. And not only do they have to replace all of that stuff, they've killed a lot of corals and fish in the process. And they've already jumped into a negative experience and they're back where they started, minus a few thousand dollars. So if you could take it real slow, do plenty of research. And the problem right now that I think that beginners are gonna run into is the whole doing research part. It's very difficult to find a lot of consistent information. You're gonna see plenty of people that have very different recommendations from me, which is fine. A lot of stuff in this hobby works at a certain level. But what is nice about the internet age is that you can check the receipts. So if the, if the people that are advocating certain positions out there, um, are they able to back to, to demonstrably back up whatever it is that they're saying with their own work product, right? If their tank looks like garbage, stop listening to them. Like, I, I, I can't stress that enough. The people that have like really, really amazing aquariums and you want to take their advice, go for it. But just anybody talking online that's just talking crazy, like check the receipts. Back in the day, you weren't able to do that. Like this, just the loudest voice in the room usually just dominated the discussion and 
people for decades did dumb stuff just based on oh this cult of personality around such and such name that got internet f- famous without it literally no pictures of their tank ever yeah those people don't they're not around anymore oh, let's see need help getting rid of vermetted snails any thoughts uh, I have some thoughts you're not gonna like it but my way of getting rid of vermetted snails involves uh, a siphon and uh, bone cutters and slowly going through and picking them off one by one over the course of a few months Let's see. Yeah, so ATF is wondering what percentage of saltwater enthusiasts are fish only with live rocks, soft corals, hard corals, mixed reef. Yeah, so like uh, just so in, in, in chat, real quick, uh, I would say, so people have multiple tanks uh, occasionally. So why don't we just say like your number one tank? What is it? I'm, I'm kind of curious myself. Topless Reefer, how do we purchase from the live sale? So you can go to titlegardens.com slash live and you should find uh, all of these numbered corals. So for example, if you're interested in this pink pasilopora, we're at item number 50. You would just take item number 50, toss it into your shopping cart and then check out like it's a regular item. But all of the perching is, is done through titlegardens.com. Uh, multiple tank syndrome. <laughs> That's what that is. I definitely have it. That or I, ha I have no tanks, one of the two, right? So if you count all the stuff that I have for the business, I've got a lot of tanks. If you count all the tanks I have at home. I'm not really in the hobby. <laughs> I have zero tanks in my house, which is like really crazy. Well, I don't know if it's crazy, but there's another store here called Aquatica. And it's uh, owned by a guy named Steve. He's been in the hobby for 50 billion years, just like me. And, um, you know, he's got a, a big store and he does like dry goods, fresh water, salt water, the whole deal. And his house, he said that he has 3,000 gallons of aquariums in his house. Like, we couldn't be more different on that regard. Just, I mean, he's, he has practically my, my, my greenhouse worth of aquariums in his home. And I, I, don't even, I don't even have, like, a goldfish bowl, like nothing. So we've got a lot of mixed votes for the mixed reef. Some SPS dominant. See, I wasn't expecting anyone to have fish only with live rock. That is, I always look at those. Okay, so this is this is my somewhat spicy take. I find those tanks extremely sad looking to see kind of like five to ten fish with just live rock. It's so boring. Andrew K. Any raspberry shortcake? Yes. Or Bali Slimers in the lineup today? I think there might be some Bali Green Slimer acros. I could be wrong. See, I've done so many of these that I kind of forget which ones I did when. They kind of all blend together after a while, but I think that there are. I am sure that there's at least two raspberry shortcakes here, and those have been doing really well for us. So ATF is saying mixed, maintaining six salt water, nine fresh water. Yeah, at one time the guy that works for me, named Ben, many of you guys have probably heard me reference him before, uh, he used to have in a small apartment like 19 aquariums. This was a while back, 19 aquariums. 
and now he has a big old zero, just like me. <laughs> I mean, I think it gets to, to, to a point where if you spend all your time around it, you don't necessarily need to then take it home. But then again, you have somebody like Steve, he goes home and there's 3,000 more gallons to take care of. Intro to reefing. Are there any scripts that aren't as difficult as most are, or are they similar in difficulty? I think something got butchered in auto check there. Auto check, spell check. I think I was going to say auto chess because I've been watching a lot of these Dota auto chess videos. In, if you guys are into gaming, that's kind of like the, the hot thing right now, these auto chess games. Spell check. Let's see. Greg Reefboy. Like your videos and live shows. Thank you. Lots of good information. Ben is very helpful with lots of knowledge on corals and placement. Good to see you're passionate about the hobby. At this point, I kind of have to be, right? I'm kind of all in. <laughs> I've been wanting to do a coral only nano. Are there disadvantages to not having a fish? Yes, there are. I've always wondered that because uh, no fish isn't natural, right? Uh, I mean, over the years I've discovered that having uh, a lot of fish is very helpful. So we have these 30 gallon tanks. One of our systems has a bunch of different tanks all plumbed together. So we have like some large 240 gallon tanks in there. Um, we have like a, a bow front. We've got like these 30 gallon tanks all going down into one sump. So the problem that we run into are those 30 gallon tanks. Because in some of those 30 gallon tanks, we have stuff that really can't be kept around fish because they're really good at grabbing and eating fish. So we have some Pseudocoronactus in there. We've got some tube anemones in there. Uh, and some other stuff that we have and maybe we'll only be able to put in like a damsel or something along that because we don't really want to be putting big herbivores in there and stuff like that. Don't want to be putting butterfly fish. Those 30 gallon tanks are the source of all the pests in the universe. If we're going to have some weird flatworm thing, it's going to break out in one of these 30 gallon tanks. And it's largely because there isn't that that predator force that's keeping those populations in check like in all the other aquariums in the system that that have like the good population of fish that mix of herbivores like tanks and fox faces with some kind of critter control like damsels wrasses um i mentioned butterflies already i think and even like in the in the bigger tanks uh we like to have mandarins like i didn't think i was going to like mandarins very much but it turns out that they eat something uh, that are just these little guys that like to, to hang out right around zoas, that they probably aren't actually damaging the zoas, but just by their very presence makes the zoas stressed out. And I think that they're all getting sniped by, by mandarins. So yeah, I think that having that blend of fish really helps. Now you're limited in a nano, unfortunately. So there's not a lot of fish you can really responsibly put into something that small. Yet another reason why nanos are kind of challenging. Tattooed Dancer. Jake Abs, a reef builder, said he'd like to make a video with you. That'd be a great advertisement. Yeah, we should we should do something with them occasionally. I've met Jake a few times. We are very far away from one another. He's way out in Denver. I'm way out in Ohio. But I'm sure we could get some get something worked out. Uh, let's see. How about a tank with a blue ribbon eel? Definitely no. Dwarf eel, maybe. Panther grouper, no. <laughs> Those things are so big. Uh, dwarf lionfish, maybe. Trigger, maybe. Queen angel, probably not. Uh, not sure that would be sad. Uh, you could put leathers in there. That's actually true. So the, the whole fish only with live rock thing. There are definitely things you can put in there that fish will not mess with. So like if you've got groupers or something like that that you're really into, there's nothing wrong with keeping corals in a grouper aquarium because grouper's not going to do anything to the aquarium or to the corals. 
They're going to poop a lot in the aquarium, so you kind of have to watch out for that. <laughs> Tattoo dancer, Dota Auto Chess Rocks. Which streamers do you watch? Uh, at this point, I watch all of them. Right now, I'm watching not actually Dota Auto Chess. Right now, I'm watching the, the League of Legends one, uh, TFT. And I'm watching uh, Fogged. I think it's his full thing is Fogged FTW2. And I'm watching uh, Disguised Toast. I don't know if I'm watching anybody else. Uh, fan. So Jansen Smith is asking, what are your thoughts on copper band versus peppermint shrimp for natural aptasia control? I use both. So in larger aquariums, I prefer a copper band. In smaller aquariums, I like peppermint shrimp. And oftentimes, I kind of know when the peppermint shrimp have kind of uh, all died because they'll we'll start having Aptasia show up in a smaller aquarium. Uh, let's see, saltwater, H2O, NaCl. Last week, I installed a new Clarisy. Since then, some of my corals are not happy and the rest are fine. All water tests are spot on. What's wrong? Could it be over clean water? So we are finally at the point where I think it is possible to have over clean water. So this is just like my personal thing, but I don't do any mechanical filtration in that way. So I don't use filter socks. Um, I don't use any kind of like the, that filter floss roller thing. I don't use sections of, of roller material or anything to collect detritus. The only thing we, thing we do with detritus is we try to have it all accumulate in one spot and periodically siphon it out. So I, th I wonder if not having a lot of that stuff in the water is kind of like stifling coral nutrition. I don't really have any data to back this up, but I guess in a practical sense also, as far as maintenance goes, Filter socks are just the worst. For a home aquarium, I think if you only had like a couple filter socks to clean every few days, perhaps, it's not that big of a deal. But once you start to scale up into a big facility, I don't want anything to do with that. But going back to your original question, I think our tanks tend to be underfed and things like, like constantly mechanically filtering tanks might exacerbate that issue. Again, totally like no data to back up anything I just said. It's just kind of this anecdotal observation I've made. Our stuff does way better when we feed a lot more. Uh, let's see. Elton Fonville. Protopalliothel are becoming invasive in my tank. Are they harmful to my other corals both LPS and SPS. Uh, they're harmful in the sense that they will sting nearby colonies, yes. So if they're taking over, you might have to thin out the herd a little bit. Now, be aware, I, see, I, I, have to, I have to kind of remember that a lot of people are can be unfamiliar with these things. But protopaleothella, paleothella in general, there's, that, there's the palytoxin risk. I've probably said it a million times. I assume other people have heard it a million times, but some people haven't. And even some people that should know better sometimes still do something else and nearly get themselves killed. Like, I sold a whole bunch of, uh, of Paleothoa to a place that does this professionally. It's not like some, some noob hobbyist that I put Paleothoa into their into their hands and then the one does, did something crazy like these are industry professionals and somehow like the new guy that does propagation got tasked with propagating these things and he ran the whole bucket full of Paleothoa through a bandsaw and got everybody in the whole building sick including the programmer upstairs 
Yeah. So I have to say, if you do decide to thin out the Palliothella in your tank, take precautions. Palliotoxin is real. It's a thing. Okay. Fan, I am AM is at is saying, I am following your golden rule. Wait and research, but start at a nano to learn more. I use live rock from a friend and currently only have inverts. I want to try coral, but not sure which family. Uh, AM, I would say just try something you like the look of. I mean, don't necessarily get into something that you're so restricted by, unless something is just like a known difficult thing. So I would stay away from doing Acropora in a nano. I would stay away from not non-photosynthetic corals. It took me, how long have I been in the hobby? 30 something years, 35 years? 35 years to successfully keep sun coral alive. Uh, we, like, this is crazy, but we have this one colony of sun coral. And I've never been able to keep this stuff alive before because in a, in a place my size, neglect happens. And these things just never get fed enough. They eventually just wither away. So we decided just to like go all in with this one particular colony. We stuck it right underneath the power head because we saw somebody online did it and they were having great success because the, the, the little Tunzi pump kind of makes this swirl of flow that kind of brings food to it more. And then we just put like a thing of frozen food, like thawed, right on the top of the aquarium. And every time we would walk by, we would take a turkey baster full of the food and shoot it on that coral every time we walked by. So we would feed this thing maybe 30 to 50 times a day. And lo and behold, it's doing well. The, the first time ever, because it was actually retracting and losing flesh. But after it stabilized, now it's uh, producing additional heads and everything. I've never had that happen before. And it is us consistently feeding it, no joke, 30 times a day. So something like that, probably not going to be great in a nano. Green star polyps like this might be a little bit more appropriate. They might, they might grow fast though. Okay, I am behind in chat, so let's see how fast I can blow through this. Uh, fan, how fast do Aptasia populate fast? Can they spit babies in the water column? They can do everything. They're really good at making themselves more. Uh, let's see. Tyler, my tank is not large enough for a copper band, so a peppermint was perfect and they did work for me. Yes, definitely. Uh, let's see. Heavy in, heavy out in regards to nutrition. I agree with that, Tattoo Dancer. Uh, let's see. Oh my god, that snowflake is the one that your mom wouldn't let me buy. That is entirely possible. That is entirely possible, Harkins. Mandrake, not all members of Paleothoa make uh, Paleothoa uh, toxins. That is true. Um, so I don't think most Zoas make it, but it's it's a concern that people have. And you know, people get on my case about not mentioning it every single time. It's like, chances are you're not going to run into a problem. However, there are these Paleothoa that if I like so much as like look at them too hard, I start feeling weird. <laughs> if I And if I touch them, I can, I can already feel, hmm. Weird, like it's something in my mouth, it's weird. Mm. And then uh, like other times, like I, I, we don't propagate that stuff. We just kind of like let that go. It's like it's like a radioactive rock just kind of like sitting there like, maybe we just kind of ignore it. It'll just kind of not do anything. <laughs> yeah, we don't propagate that stuff ever. So, so the people that are coming to the barbecue, if you guys want giant things of, of Paleothoa, uh, we could probably work out something very close to free if you just wanted to take a whole bunch of it. I mean, some people really like that stuff. Like, you know, big time hobbyists. Some people really just like that stuff. It's just not something that's what we want to keep anymore. And it's not even so much, it's, it's, a, it's both a, a danger thing, kind of, but it's more just we're on to other stuff and we just want to like free up space. And since we don't propagate and we don't sell, actively sell a lot of it, it just kind of sits there. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
razor blades, cut proof gloves, nitrile gloves, full face mask. I guess you could. Sun corals grow rampant in Florida. It wouldn't surprise me if it's one of those things where like the dirtier the water, the better the sun coral. Kind of like the, the situation with like oysters. The best oysters I've ever had were from the grossest looking water that I don't even want to swim in. Dave B, thanks for this $5 super chat. Uh, I've been gifted a Pico tank and I'm wondering if you could share some good species for that size. Ugh. So you're already behind the eight ball with the size of the aquarium, right? Like the smaller the aquarium, it's a lot more challenging. So stuff that might do well, actually zoas might do well. Zoas, maybe some mushrooms, things like a discosoma perhaps, maybe a redactus. I would kind of look in, in, in that in that realm. But if you're talking about like a really small tank, I would I would consider like Zoas probably be the, the the best bet because they themselves are small and you can get a ton of varieties of color all kind of mixed in there. Uh, intro to reefing, can corals be freshwater dipped? Harkin says, I wouldn't do it. For 99.9%, .9%, I would say don't do it. There are, the only thing that I personally would freshwater dip if I was going to dip, freshwater dip anything are zoanthids. Um, there's stuff that that can resist uh, a coral RX dip, things like that, that don't do that well with fresh water. And very few corals can handle fresh water. So anthids tend to be okay. So nothing more than like two to five minutes. And by the way, freshwater dipping, I think that people, or just dipping in general, I think people don't quite understand that you don't just like set the coral in there. You have to constantly agitate the coral. So when we're talking freshwater dip, just, you're not just dunking it, but you're also being you know proactive about trying to, to, to shoot it through and, and knock stuff off the coral. Uh, let's see, Aqua Splendor. I'm noticing some of my Micromusa colors are starting to look like the same color as the food. I have never heard that before. That's very interesting. Yeah, I'm kind of curious as to what food that you're feeding that has changed the color. Because typically, when you're talking Micromusa, uh, the thing that dictates color more than anything is lighting. Uh, a lot of times, they, they change color dramatically under LED versus like T5, for example. Uh, T Mac is wondering. I have a small pico tank. Just got in the hobby. What's your opinion of reefroids? Can I cause nutrients to rise too quickly using it? It's all portion control there, right? You can make, you can use anything to raise your nutrient level. Uh, a lot of people are happy with reefroids, and we use it as a part of our gumbo of different products that we feed. Like we, if we can't even say what what aspect for what coral. Is making any difference but we probably mix together like five different types of dry foods to go along with our frozen stuff uh, reef therapy are tickets to the barbecue available until the day of the event uh, yes to some extent so the problem with um, doing it last minute is we might not have a gift bag available for you like I don't think the food is gonna be an issue you're gonna get fed but um, like we're working with sponsors already to like provide some some like little free samples and stuff like that, and you know we're we're putting in so the 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 cost to attend the barbecue is twenty five dollars. We will be providing a twenty five dollar gift card, so that is taken care of. But there's some other sponsors that had donated a certain number, and um, like last minute we might run out of certain things not our gift cards so there will be that but that's the only uh, issue reef therapy with like doing it last last minute but we're, we're getting close to the to the point where um, we're pretty much settled so the, the the only like last minute thing that would be I guess a, a preparation thing for us is just to make sure there's that we've ordered enough food because 
that's not something that we're going to be able to do spur of the moment. Let's see. Uh, Phil Harton, would a freshwater dip be a cure for zoas that are not opening? So that's a very interesting question. I don't know if it's necessarily just a freshwater dip, but sometimes we do run into issues of zoas not opening, and it's almost always something is actively bothering it. And I went to this other wholesaler's place, and I really liked the way that their zoas looked. And straight up, his key to success was pretty much on, on a schedule, dip those corals, and including a freshwater dip. And I think that that kind of extends to, all, to a lot of different types of corals. Um, keeping stuff clean, and I'm not necessarily just talking about pests. Sometimes it's just some completely innocent critter that is making like a mucus den that attracts detritus. The detritus is what's bothering the coral, stuff like that. But constantly keeping these things uh, like cleaner greatly increases how much they, they open up for you, and it greatly increases um, their growth rates and just like the, the extension. I've seen some things, um, you know, not so much like, for example, with what you're seeing behind me, like with the favias and, and things, that'll be more growth rate, growth rate related. But there's certain corals that are just way bigger when they're not under stress. So like zoas, for example, even like the really little ones, it, when they're happier and healthier, uh, they could be four times the size. So case in point, uh, my personal trainer, we sold him some radioactive dragon izoas, and he grew his vertically on his overflow box and was basically directing water at that overflow box. So there's nothing that could really settle on the polyps, and the constant flow was keeping stuff uh, just just you know a lot of movement around those particular those zoas. I swear those zoas were easily like eight times bigger than the ones that we were keeping and we sold those exact ones to him like the way that you kind of go about keeping the corals makes a huge difference so back to your original question a periodic freshwater dip might help out quite a lot just constantly keeping stuff clean So tattooed dancers asking about snake polyps, seen it open twice at night. It's alive and fluorescent, but still only one polyp. You know, I don't pay a lot of attention to those things. I would assume that's a feeding thing. Like if you could try to like feed that thing at night, it might do some wonders for you. Little Reefer, Lacry drew your acro. Yes, she did. Yeah, she helped out a lot with uh, with my Patreon account. That she was one of the the more interesting people that I've met at the last uh, last trade show I was at, Aquashala down in Dallas. Yeah, it's like she has she's uh, an artist. She has this channel has about a quarter million subscribers, has a really big following on Patreon. She was giving me some ideas on how to improve my own Patreon community. Very cool. So Aqua Splendor, Micromusa has been feeding Reefroids, started to feed Seachem Reef Plus. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the first thing that I should probably mention about, uh, about Acans and Micromusa, it's clear to me that a lot of feeding is really good for them. Now, I, I, maybe I would hesitate to use like a powdered product heavily or like a pellet product heavily because sometimes they're like overly rich and sometimes it just like melts the polyp. I've heard of that happen before. But this same uh, wholesaler that was doing a lot of cleaning as far as their zoas go um, had like this kind of the, the VIP section of Micromusa lortoensis. And it was like really rainbow colored cool stuff. 
and they fed those things like crazy. And the polyps are so gigantic on them. They're so healthy. And that's one of the things that I can't wait about the new systems that are going to be going in downstairs. There's some stuff that we just don't do very well out of the greenhouse. And one of those things is just be able to turn off all the pumps, make the water super, you know, super still, and just directly feed a whole bunch of corals and then kick the pumps on 15 minutes later. I know it's it's a total design flaw that we can't do that well. We can't do it well. And we haven't done it in, in ages. But that is going to be a total game changer downstairs because we're going to have the controls right at every single tank. We need to shut off the flow. We can shut it off right there. The rest of the system keeps on running, but that 10-foot tank in front of us is still. We could do all of our feeding and stuff because, yeah, the proof is in the pudding there. Again, right, checking receipts. I saw the damn receipts, and those receipts said that these corals are doing 10 times better than anything I've ever done in my systems lately. Way back in the day, when I was able to turn off the pumps, we had acans, or, well, they were, I guess they were acans at that time, not Micromusa, but they, um, they were huge. So it's all about the feedings for those guys. <clears throat> Sorry guys, I'm trying to get caught up on some of the the comments. Little reefer, my favia is directly below a stream of flow for my SPS, but how can I tell if it's doing okay? Do I know that a new head has grown? I, well, I do know that a new head has grown. Growth is always a really good indicator of health. The other thing is you, you might want to look at is just like the, the fleshiness of the polyp itself. Oftentimes that is a good sign. And also if its tentacles are extended looking for food. So a combination of those three things. but. You've already knocked down one of them. If it's growing, that's instantly like the number one sign of it's probably fine. Kind of afraid to get an anemone, but my clownfish keeps annoying my zoas I put in. I've seen some hosts and corals. Yeah. Yeah, T-Mac, it can be tough. Sometimes they don't host in anything, sometimes they host in everything. And this guy is why, this is, this is the spicy take of the live show. I don't like clownfish. Like, there will be some number of clownfish really close to zero in this, uh, in this new building. And there will be um, single digit number of tangs in this building as well. Tangs and clownfish are canceled here. Adam, any tips for getting great acro polyp extension like you have? Uh, I think one thing that we do a lot, so I should preface that with a lot of times the acros that we have are, um, are millipora that tend to already have some good polyp extension. The next thing is probably the type of feeding that we do. Like the, the stuff that we put in the water is very um, cloudy. A lot of rotifers. So a, a lot of frozen foods that, that are available in the hobby now are rinsed. So it is it is like you get mysis shrimp, you get krill, you get, and then very little other stuff to make that cloudy supernate. Excuse me. So we don't do that. Like we buy the stuff in bulk. Whatever shows up in that package is going to go into the cups that we're eventually going to feed into the tanks. And it's a very messy, oily mix. 
and I think that these corals really enjoy it. So like I'm looking at item number 107 here. So do you see that kind of that mucus thing that's kind of like dangling around at its base? That happens every single time that we feed. So it's entirely possible that, that this tank was recently fed and that mucus coat that forms these strings happens all over our acros and slowly over time those strings get drawn into the mouths and the acropora eats. What happens most of, most of the time is some jerk tang comes over and will eat that mucus. But we do notice it pretty consistently that um, they're eating constantly because we do try to feed you know a few times a day now and that they, they seem to love that stuff. Clownfish are jerks. Yes, Decanthus Reef, they are. Like, they got they get so much positive. And you know, and I'm sure that I'm messing with someone someone's business out there because like there's a big business of you know selling tank raised clownfish. Thanks, I hate it. <laughs> Black refine art. You don't like clownfish? We can't be friends. I don't like clownfish. I'm super racist against clownfish. Uh, Marcus Hunter, is there any possibility the corals can be shipped to India? I'm afraid not. We only ship to the U.S., excluding Hawaii. So we can ship to Alaska, we can ship to Puerto Rico even, no Hawaii, and no place else other than the U.S. <laughs> Harkins is like, well known that you hate clownfish. Yeah, I don't like tangs either. <laughs> Two, please. Thank you for the dollar ninety nine. Loved your happy birthday to Rico. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He he had uh, his birthday the same date as another one of my friends. So it just like kind of like reminded me like oh, that's so and so's birthday. Better say happy birthday to her too. Let's see, Tristan. In your travels, have you seen blue-green chromis and spring-grid damsels kept successfully in the same tank? Blue-green chromis and spring-grid damsels. Um, must be. You know what? What's funny is that most people don't keep damsels, right? I think that the 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 way that I feel about clownfish is the way that everybody else feels about damsels. And uh, I think for a lot, I mean, for at least 20 years, I remember this on the forums, like anytime that anybody said, hey, I'm just starting out in the hobby and I like to get a damsel, and everybody was like, put the brakes on that. No, that's a terrible decision. Those things are so mean. They're going to fight and kill everything and blah, blah, blah. And here's the thing. They're mean. They are mean, mean little fish. But uh, yeah, like a lot of people just don't have damsels in general, and I'm just trying to. And, and, and chromis are kind of the exception because they're like you know the little wimpy guys that just don't do anything. Um, I, I can't imagine that would be an issue. I can't imagine, especially in such a large tank. Oh well, I'm not a cat person. You know what? No one's perfect, Lisa. No one's perfect. Dharma bum, uh, do you ever get diaceras plates? We do. We have a super high end, like bright red one. We haven't put it up for sale yet. Uh, we will at some point. It'll be a lot of money. But yes, we do very rarely get like really nice diaceruses. But whenever we do, we end up just uh, kind of hanging onto it and propagating it because you can probably imagine they cost a fortune. Springeri are the exception damsel. Uh, they bite me. So the, the reason why I put up with certain damsels, like, like the Springer's damsels, uh, is because they do a pretty good job on a lot of different types of pests. So I like mine because um, I've seen them, like actually seen them eat flatworms off the glass and things like that. Um, and yeah, it's just, an, it's just another type of like invert predator that I'm all about. Uh, Aqua Splendor, what is your take on anemone price over time, 10 plus years? Do you notice a drop in price? 
like the common one with rainbow bubble tips. So that's kind of interesting. What I have noticed is kind of like a, like a, a double hump. <laughs> Uh, so the first, when I first became aware of them, this would have been in the 90s, so probably like right around like 1995, a rose bubble tip was about $400. In 1990s money, which is probably $750 now probably, I don't know. Economists in chat, you do the time value calculation on your own. But that was, you know, a, that was just a red bubble tip anemone. Then they got really ubiquitous in the hobby through aquaculture efforts, probably some increased importing efforts, whatever. Price goes down to roughly $50. I mean, we were selling them for $50 on the live show. And then lately, because perhaps, again, it could be lack of propagation or complete lack of import, but they've gone up in price again. So ours right now are, are expensive on the website. They're probably close to $400. I don't really remember. But uh, then there are like some super high-end color morphs, which are like thousands of dollars. So that's, that's kind of like where I, I've seen stuff go. So if anything, it seems like it's been more affected by import than by aquaculture. And I, and I think that maybe it's because at a hobbyist scale, aquaculturing those bubble tips makes more sense than at a commercial scale because of the space and time required to do it. I'm only speculating there because we don't really do it at all. The, the most I've ever seen is when like home hobbyists will do it, they'll run out of space and then they'll sell to somebody like me or trade. Mostly reefs as spring grass are fairly peaceful. My chromis are the aggressors. That is something I would not have expected. Tattoo Dancer is not a fan of damsels. They do too much work for me to ignore. They they do good work here. Uh, Lou is asking, hi Than, any fish that eats zoanthid eating nudies? That's interesting. Um, I haven't seen it happen personally. I haven't actually seen it. But what I have noticed is the tanks with damsels and wrasses tend to do better on that front. So occasionally, well, less so now because we don't we're not bringing in a ton of like zoas. So if you're if you're if you have a place that brings in a lot of freshly caught from the ocean zoas, guaranteed, all of those have like nudie bronx. I don't trust any of them. So whenever we do that, we we're like you know this is a conscious decision we're making. How much do we love? All of our existing zoas, because we bring this one rock in, I guarantee we're gonna have like a we're gonna have a nudie bronc problem. So we have kind of like not kind of gone away from that, but you know with with frequent dipping, just to, just to like bring the populations down, plus predation, that usually takes care of the zoanthid eating nudie bronc issue. Uh, the Montipora eating nudie bronc things are way more difficult for whatever reason, but the zoanthid eating ones can kind of be, be handled with fish, I think. Scott Morrison, I'm a younger reefer, I'm a young reefer, all right, I'm just going to skip it. Uh, so softies and two triple-headed Duncans, but already want a bigger tank, Red Sea Reefer 750. I am all about bigger aquariums. So Scott, if you're if you're in the market for a much bigger aquarium, I say go for it. Uh, Brett Com, is there any fish that eats bryopsis? Not reliably. And if you have a bryopsis problem, very unlikely that a fish is gonna handle it for you. So we have like maybe a teaspoon worth of bryopsis in our whole place. Okay? And Usually that's just a, we'll just like wipe it up with a sponge, take it out, and it's done with, right? And occasionally, if it's like entwined into like a little bit of rock or something, we can take that rock, and there's a certain uh, fish tank that we can put it in that has a tang and a fox face that is ridiculously aggressive about eating algae. And those guys do eat bryopsis, but I think if we had like a tank where we had like a bryopsis explosion, 
those two fish are going to eat like the first, I don't know, couple inches of it and be like, okay, we're done with that. That's gross. And never touch it again. So if you are having an issue with bryopsis, there's a whole lot wrong going on in your tank. Sorry. If it wasn't already obvious by the whole bryopsis thing. But it's going to take a little bit of, of scrubbing on your part, a little bit of water change, and a little bit of chemical maintenance perhaps. And I'm not talking about like some type of uh, antimicrobial even, but just to kind of kill the, the problem at its source. Likely a phosphate issue, likely just an overabundance of nutrient issue. And it might take a little while to do it, but that's probably something I see in your future if bryopsis is really a big problem. Uh, David Hum, my Montipore is starting to bleach. Can I stop it? Uh, yes. Depends on what is causing it. If it's a lighting issue, if you're somehow overpowering the coral with light, possible to do. Not easy, but possible. Um, simply lowering light intensity will fix your issue. A much more difficult issue is if it's Montipora eating nudibranchs. Uh, that is that might be an unwinnable challenge, unfortunately. That's one of the most difficult pest issues. So I'm gonna do a quick search, Montipor eating nudibranch. See if you anything you see resembles that. If it does, there are ways to get rid of them. Some more effective than others. Most people lose that battle. Uh, Phil, do you keep any mollies in your tanks? I don't know if you're asking me. Sometimes people do the whole like molly thing to eat algae. Uh, I have never done it. Uh, Sutsumadori 97, how do you even dip corals regularly when they grow onto rocks over time? That is a really good question. Um, so a lot of it comes down to not letting them do that, but for like a home aquarium, well, actually, so, okay, I, I'll, I'll tackle this from like uh, a really big aquarium system, kind of like what I have. Once they start getting onto the rocks, it's time to break, up, break it all apart. For a home aquarium though, unless you're talking about a mega gigantic aquarium, let's say 55 gallons or less, you can bucket dip that stuff. It takes a little bit of effort, and you do have to like you know break down the rock work to some degree, but it can be done. Uh, the other thing is kind of like this middle ground that middle ground approach you can take. Uh, so if assuming we're not talking about pests, uh, if you're talking about pests, yeah, you're dipping the whole rock. But if you're not talking about pests, and we're talking about just uh, like detritus removal and stuff, uh, just taking like a small power head and blowing through the rocks will do wonders. Little Reefer, can you overdose amino acids? You can overdose anything. Yes. Uh, Dharma Bum, I've had success removing Montipora eating nudies with Bayer dip. Good. Uh, I've tried it before. Like the, the dips kill the nudie Bronx to, to varying degrees of success. The problem is the eggs survive everything. Abel Valencia, have you ever had salinity increases when using a lot of two-part? I personally have not. Then again, our systems are very large, and they go through a lot of not, I wouldn't call them water changes, but they're basically water change slash top-offs all the time because of how we do maintenance and because of the fact that we're selling consistently out of those aquariums. So we would never notice something like that. Two, please. Thank you again for the dollar ninety nine. Barbecue is soon. It's the twenty seventh of this month, so that's in two weeks. Uh, get your tickets ASAP. Got the links there. E N Reefs did make it. We are on. So hey, you know we have a little bit less than an hour left. So yeah, it's a good amount of time. E N Reefs. Torch MMA Empire. I destroyed the Monty eating nudie Bronx in my tank by quarantine and dipping every five days. Each dip was for 10 minutes. Some corals dead, some lived. Got rid of the problem. Yeah. 
that I could see being being one way to go. And we, we've done stuff like that before to varying degrees of success. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. What's crazy though is, so here at Tidal Gardens, we have a Montipora ban in place, okay? If we see a wild caught Montipora, if we see a Montipora in somebody else's tank that they want to bring to us for free, it's a hard no. Um, like my mom always wants to buy new Montipora. I'm like, absolutely no, because we have a good collection of Montipora brewing here. And every single time we bring in a new Montipora, it's, it's the risk it's a tremendous risk of everything in our systems going to hell because of Montipor eating nudie Bronx, right? So I'm not in favor of that. So we don't bring in new Montipora, but at certain times of the year, and I think it's like in times of um, temperature increases, that is the time when all of a sudden, like, some kind of miraculous virgin birth sort of thing after not having a problem for an entire 12 months or so, Montipore eating nudibranch spring up seemingly out of nowhere. On just on like a couple of different types of Montes. And then we aggressively dive on that and, and try to treat it. And over, I'd say, a month, we do treat it. And so, like, right now, we don't seem to have that issue. But it's the weirdest thing how, how like, they can just be dormant for the longest time, and they get this this uh, this temperature spike that works for them, and they're just back again. So yeah, like it's one of those things you just have to to always constantly be be on the lookout for. If you know what you're looking for, you'll never not be able to see them. Uh, but yeah, they they are so far for me the most challenging thing I've ever seen. It's like there there's two pests that. And I'm not, I'm not even going to say that they're common because they're not, but there's two pests in particular that I'm always horrified of. It's Montipore eating nudibranchs. It is um, torch eating flatworms. They're about like in, like this big. They can hide in plain sight, and they're they're notoriously difficult to get rid of. Let's see. Yeah, Reef Dudes. Hey, what's up? Key to beating them is sucking out the adults daily before the lights come on. Uh, getting a small yellow chorus or other pest handler. Yeah, and uh, like for, for us, we do like the, the mix of wrasses. I think my, my list of wrasses is, is about like five deep right now. Um, I like the Melanaris, I like yellow chorus, uh, leopard. I, I have not had this yet, but a tamarind I'm interested in. And I'm interested in um, these guys are like more difficult to get. They're more expensive, and they don't do well in shipping. But it's the wet morella type wrasses. I think those are called um, possum wrasses. So yeah, five. And I would put those five as a set in every single system. And I might even do like a six line, even though I'm pretty sure they don't do as much. And on top of that, I would probably put in a mandarin and a couple different types of damsels. Dip your corals when you buy Montes. That was my mistake. I'll never do that again. You should dip darn near everything. But yeah, but again, dipping is like so hit or miss when it comes to that sort of thing. And that's why I'm like, unless it's a, it's a small frag, but a wild caught colony, hard no. I don't care if that thing is like, well, maybe if it's like shooting out money out of its polyps. <laughs> but no, it's no. Oh, it's, it's such a big risk. The other problem with nudies, as opposed to some of the other pests, is that nudies are highly mobile. Like, there's no guarantee that they're just going to be stuck on your Montes. They could be anywhere in your tank and eventually make their way back onto your Montes. So you could dip the heck out of your Montes, kill off all, all the ones, Let's say you even like are successfully scraping off all the eggs, which is really hard to do also. And they just kind of like go out and they, they, they come back home and it's business as usual. 
And once you scale up, it's, it's a lot harder to uh, to manage just the sheer volume of everything. And a home aquarium is actually, again, the home hobbyists have it easier. <laughs> just easier. The scale up is what's really difficult. Little reefer, can I fuse hammer corals? Not sure what you mean by fusing them. Uh, and they will sting each other, but they probably won't kill each other with stings. Uh, so Harkins, why would you get a Mandarin for every system? Good question. I'm actually was not on team Mandarin until my dad bought them, kind of like out of the spur of the moment sort of thing. And again, not really on team Mandarin, but in larger systems where you can just keep a Mandarin and it'll just be fed naturally by everything in the in the tank. What I've noticed is a lot of the stuff that they kind of consume do have a detrimental impact on our corals. So I'm, I was going to use that, that zoanthid example again because there's all, all these little creepy crawlies on their own really aren't like attacking corals or anything, but they'd like to make these little mucus like tube nest things right on the growth edge of, an, of a zoanthid. And um, that causes like the zoanthid to close more. It causes the zoanthid to completely stop growing. And I've noticed that like those things are like the perfect like snack for mandarins. I would see them go up and they would just like eat the entire mucus nest and shoot it out their gills. And so I'm like, wow, maybe this is something that I should pay attention to. And through the entire daylight hours, that fish is constantly sniping off little critters like that. So I think the overall net positive of having a mandarin is worth having one in every system. Yeah, and in Little Reefer, it's not necessarily pods. They kill a ton of pods because I kind of like pods maybe, but it's like these things, they look like little clear mantis shrimp and they form like mucus tunnels. Uh, Lycos34, is it possible to stop my acropora from bleaching? Yes, it is. Um, what can you do to make it stop bleaching? Well, why is it bleaching to begin with? Is something you'd need to diagnose. Is it a temperature thing? Is it a chemistry thing? Is it a pest thing? Any number of things, but something is very, very definitely wrong and kind of has to be remedied for you to fix that issue. Could be a feeding issue. Austin's Reef, finally caught one of these live shows. Welcome, Austin, happy Saturday. Happy Saturday to you too. Good amount of time left too. We're going up to, I think the total is 181. Yeah, Harkins, it goes back to our, our discussion earlier about keeping corals ridiculously clean. And, uh, and part of it is just uh, making sure that detritus doesn't accumulate on the corals, but those creepy crawlies kind of accelerate the, the amount of detritus that ends up touching our corals. And yeah, just having, having fish that constantly eliminate that issue goes a long way. Ooh, okay, I'm not gonna try to pronounce your name, but it's something on air. No, I'm not gonna try. Uh, do you have any advice on bubble algaes in a non fish tank. Um, bubble algae and non-fish tank. It's a challenge. Your best bet is to re is to siphon remove them. And, uh, and if you're on item number 148, that's what we have to deal with a lot. Giant fish, photobombing, and, and, and the worst thing is sometimes like you'll, you'll see like a coral. Uh, a lot of times it's like the more um, sensitive guys that take a while to reopen are closed during my live show and it's because sometimes these fish just come and grab the entire plug and chuck it <laughs> right as I'm about to shoot it uh, yeah so again bubble algae it's gonna be physical removal and trying to siphon as much as possible so I just learned I don't know why I just learned this maybe I didn't know it before and I forgot but bubble algae valonia it's a single cell so like even when they're like this big, that one big giant thing, oh, photobomb again, thanks fish. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a single cell organism. Ernie Wallace, greetings, Dan. Greetings to you too, Ernie. Oh, emerald crab, Little Reefer says. For some reason, I don't trust crabs. Uh, tattoo Dancer, what about having an isolated quarantine tank for Montiporos? Your mother can take care of it. <laughs> so um, maybe in the new in the new building, we might be able to set up something like that. Uh, and for home Aquarius, good idea. For other stores, also good idea. What makes it difficult for us is that our greenhouse was the only place where we were keeping corals. And we don't have heating and cooling systems adequate to keep something, a smaller body of water, under control. Um, we might now, but still kind of unlikely. Uh, it's, it's hard to keep tanks cool. It's hard to, it's pretty easy to warm them up in the, in the winter, but it's hard to keep it cool in the summer. So it's 90 degrees outside, we would have to run an active chiller. And for the longest time, we didn't have the electrical capacity to run a chiller in there. The creepy crawlies that you speak of are also in search of detritus. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you talking like to try to sort of like eliminate it? Because the, the stuff I'm talking about, it, they're, they're incorporating it into their homes, essentially. And I think that's where you, you run into to issues of that detritus then being like in constant contact with the corals. And after all that talk about, about Monty pests and stuff like that, we're into the Monty section apparently on the, on the live show. Which, you know, for given the time of season that this is, being like deep into summer, we've had by far the most success this year with coral coloration. And I know that we're like onto something because every single time somebody that like knows what they're looking for color wise with SPS, they come over and they're like, uh, your acros and your other SPS have insanely good color. And I'm thinking like, yes, you know, we've, we've been making these, these incremental improvements over the years and we've, we're finally at the point where we can very successfully grow these things out in the greenhouse. Almost to a detriment because sometimes like we'll run into like a weird little pest issue and not be aware of it because the coral is doing so well. And then I'll notice something like, we better dip these just to be sure. And sure enough, there was like something weird there. But so now we're, we're more in the process of, you know what, I don't care if it looks healthy or not. I want to see, you know, dipping just to see if something, if something weird jumps off of these things. But yeah, we've had like such good success with this. And now I'm worried that, you know, the whole idea of like doing this new building, in addition to scaling up, was to having a lot more control for SPS like the Montiporas and the Acroporas and stuff like that that really do thrive with more consistency. What if the key really was the greenhouse itself? And a lot of the stuff that was working right over there is stuff that we're abandoning by going to a more regimented, scientifically controlled laboratory setting in this new building. So that's kind of like my big worry because the number of people that are coming in saying, this is some of like the, 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 the nicest colored up SPS that we're, we're seeing. It's like, yeah. And then I'm going to change it all in the new system. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see. So check back in six months. We'll see how, how well we're doing next door. Next door. Here. Versus next door. Uh, Ernie Wallace. Question for you. Bother ticket to the barbecue. You can't make it. Sister said it to come into town. Can you just ship the goodie bag? Uh, we might be able to. Um, yeah, somebody else, like Harkins, I think, uh, wanted his shipped as well. So I will see what I can do for that. Um, I have an inkling of a suspicion that we'll see. I, I just want to make sure that we have enough goodie bags for everybody. And if it comes down to it, and that we might have to cannibalize some uh, some goodie bags that didn't show up to like you know take care take care of everybody here. I will put together a goodie bag to send to 
the folks that couldn't make it as well. So we, we, we can, long story short, we can. I just, had, I just need to figure it out. Uh, let's see. It would be cool to have a system for income and corals, just like worldwide coral. Well, what we're planning on doing is having the entire greenhouse next door be the system for incoming coral. So like there, it'll get, it'll get dipped regularly, blah, blah, blah. It will have the fish in place to handle it. And eventually, once we decide to, to bring it over to get aquacultured into these systems, it will have had plenty of time to kind of, well, we would have plenty of time to kind of deal with any issues over there. Because like right now, the, the whole idea of like bringing stuff in, dipping it, blah, blah, blah and, and then just then introducing it to the systems, obviously not as good. Yes, building it for their nests, correct. Uh, intro to reefing, this is kind of a dumb question, but can you frag flatworms, like not cutting them in half, but cutting them off of rocks? Can you frag flatworms? I don't know if it's a dumb question, it's just one that doesn't quite make sense. Because like a flatworm I mean, it's 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 so mobile, right? It's like they'll move if you just like just bump them slightly, right? So like cutting them off of rocks really isn't a thing. They're not permanently settled on, on rocks. Uh, let's see, Lil Reefer, if. Lacree is seeing this. Can you please draw an aquarium with sand and rocks and a wave maker? <laughs> It'd be so cool. Yeah, I don't know if she's still watching or not. Harkins, I would love to get mine shipped, but it's up to you. I'll ship you something. How's that? I'll, I'll try to put together as much as I can, right? Because so, some, some vendors were only able to do a certain number of things. So I'm thinking that number is dangerously close to the number of tickets that were bought, meaning if more people buy tickets, which obviously I'm encouraging people to do, it's like they might run short of that stuff. So I'm already thinking ahead of like other things that I, that I can substitute in for that stuff. So it's a work in progress. But of, of the stuff that I can control, sure. And, and like, for example, um, we were asking for certain quantities and like some people were like, you know what, we'll send some extra just in case. And I'm like, well, the number that you ended up with is definitely more than what we we're expecting. So great. Other people were like, yeah, I know that you wanted like X number. We could only get you half of that. So we're sending that. I'm like, okay, I hope that'll be enough. But I hope people aren't going to be super bummed out if they didn't get that sample of fish food or something. I don't know. We'll see. <clears throat> uh... Do I need to bring a hot plate to the barbecue? No, I don't think so. Uh, uh, tattoo dancer. So you're actually doubling the amount of water you keep or are you reducing the greenhouse? No, we're basically just going to make one of the systems like the, the new system where everything is going to get stashed into and then relocated from there. So all the de details aren't worked out, but I want to fully rework the greenhouse. There are some design issues like we were, I don't know if you were here for the very beginning, but we were talking about uh, some, we were talking about like highly productive water versus kind of like wasted water in terms of gallonage. And so there are wasted gallons that are, are not particularly productive out in the greenhouse. And if I redesign the, all, all the systems in the greenhouse, uh, I can kind of optimize all that more. And I would want to have one quarter of the, the, the newly worked systems there. One system would just be for quarantine. So if I had to guess, something in the ballpark of like a thousand gallons just for bringing new stuff in. Joseph, Joseph Puzo, have you ever 
have corals come in that you never ever saw something that totally shocks you occasionally but generally speaking there's a reason why certain things come in hardly ever is because they're they have like a horrendous survival rate or something like that some weird sponge or, or, or a, like a nudie bra or not a nudie bra, like, like a tunicate of some sort things like that right then occasionally you see a known coral with the most absolutely absurd coloration like uh, something was shared on social media just yesterday it was uh, an an a can um, I guess that typically that one is a might be a homophilia not really sure but it's a uh, it's a what used to be an a can bower banky and it looked like it was tie-dyed out of like nine colors like it was absolutely crazy and just like knowing what I know about prices I can tell you that thing probably costs as much as a car like it was it was that special in terms of color and size uh, Adam what are your thoughts on gold torches uh, they are not a good value right now they are the most expensive torch right now um, I think a lot of that is just supply and demand around torches in general. Torches, period, are expensive. Uh, they are all coming out of Australia except for aquacultured Indonesian stuff, which is arguably even more expensive. Uh, the gold torch has always been the most desirable of the Australian torches. And for, for a short period of time, they were difficult to collect or difficult to find some combination of those two and supplies were really limited so they were selling for a whole bunch of money wholesale meaning they're going to sell for an even whole bunch or more money retail so the last i checked i've seen some that were bordering on a thousand dollars for a gold torch not a great value but you know what? people like what they like and I don't begrudge anybody spending that kind of money on something that they like. I do it all the time. <laughs> so there you go. Andreas, nice channel. Thank you. Can you make a video on how to make rockscaping for good coral growth? Um, I can. So I plan on having two show tanks here in this new building and I'll probably be doing like a tank series on, on, on how they were set up and hopefully I don't fall on my face and it just turns into a huge disaster but a part of that will be building the rockscape um, so if you're familiar with Rico's Aquariums another youtuber he's probably gonna help me out a bit with the rockscape he did a really good job I think on his latest aquarium build his 500 gallon tank and I was like looking at his rockscape like you know what if one of my show tanks had a rockscape that looked exactly like this I'd be really happy and so we might just like sit down one day and start you know piecing together stuff and coming up with something like that Uh, let's see, Phil, Zoophrags my Frank Tech are still having uh, problems opening. Um, so yeah, it could be detritus. So again, I would, so I would try to dip them maybe like a couple of times. Sometimes it, it is as simple as they've developed a little bit of a waxy coat because in the summertime, it does weird things to certain corals. And oh, did we start over again? Nope, not yet. We're still on, on, on Zoas and Pallies. Um, so I know that sometimes that can then can cause stuff to close. Um, if you've seen some other videos where I talk about like reef aquarium hacks, one of the things is like a makeup brush. If you just buy like a an inexpensive makeup brush with really soft bristles, you can kind of go over a zoa colony and just dislodge stuff that might have been kind of growing on it that have caused to to keep to stay closed. But dipping will go a long way, and then sometimes just patience. We've had certain zoas that were just like kind of upset for a long time, and also additional flow, like you mentioned, could help. And 
after a while, they just adjusted to the aquarium and started to, to grow again. But again, if you want to be more proactive about it, dipping, make a brush, additional flow will go a long way. Recordia are, are beautiful. Do you suggest them for beginners? They're fine for beginners, I think. Do you ever move fish around depending on which tank needs what? No, I do not. No, pretty much they're staying. It's, it's, it's a pain to catch fish. I only have one Aussie torch I've been neglecting. It's massive. So, um, yeah, the so for example, like the, this uh, number one seventy six scrambled exoas. There's two polyps that are closed there. That might just be from a fish tossing it right before I started filming. But what's more likely is it could just be like algae. Like in, in this time of year, there's we it's not we don't have a ton of problematic pest algaes. But sometimes what happens is you get that, that kind of brown film, right? that just grows on your glass. And sometimes that just can make its way onto a coral's mucus coat and just kind of congest the polyps. So like I said, makeup brush, quick dip, even like a freshwater dip for zoas could work. So the funny thing about, uh, about torches and gold torches is just like the, pro the price fluctuation. The cheapest I've ever seen them was about $25 per polyp. The most expensive I've seen them was $1,000 per polyp. The time difference between those two prices is probably two years. Like, prices for certain things can go nuts. In one of your vids, you said there was a really special branching gold hammer. Was this wild caught? Yes, that was, uh, that was an Indonesian one that I will definitely not ever see again. I've never seen another one ever again, period. Like anywhere, not even in pictures. So Lycos 34, I have a lot of small pistol shrimp that come from Lybrook from the Mediterranean. Is that a problem for corals? It's tough to say, usually no. Um, I, I personally haven't had any issues with, with pistol shrimp. Uh, the only thing is, I wonder if one of one pistol shrimp I had may have killed a fish once, but I'm not sure. Two, please. How long should a yellow tang live from birth to death on average? So this is one of those things where, like, I think we as hobbyists could always do a better job of, right? When it comes to like life expectancy of fish. So my fish tend to live a really long time. What kills the fish is when they jump. So getting them straight for a, from a wholesaler, within 48 hours, a lot of times they'll die because God knows how they were handled, right? They'll, they'll come in, they look fine, super dead in 24 hours. It's the craziest thing. And that's not even a quarantine thing. You can put them in whatever tank you want. They might be dead the next day. So that's kind of like the, the wholesale fish trade. So when you're buying from like a from a local pet store, for example, the good ones will do the whole quarantining and and all that stuff for you, and they'll have that thing in quarantine for like maybe two three weeks, and they'll charge for it. That's very very valuable what they've just done for you. They've taken a huge element of risk out of buying a fish. Now, as far as like you keeping that fish long term, like what would define a good successful period to keep a fish? For me, I'm always shocked when a fish dies. But usually for me, it's when a fish jumps. It's not when a fish ages to death or whatever. So the, the, the oldest fish that we have here is probably six, seven years. And I think that that's a tang, right? You're asking about tangs. Uh, I would feel better if I was keeping tangs for 20 years. Um, but that's me. So it's funny when people get to talk about Koei. So I don't know if Harkins, if you're still in chat here, because uh, Harkins does pawn stuff occasionally. But people hear of a messed up idea of, of success with Koei. They, they are under the impression that, oh, keeping Koei here in Ohio it's good if you can get two, three years out of it. 
two, three years is a horrendously short lifespan for a Koei here because Koei should outlive your grandkids. They should live to be over 100 years old if you do stuff right. And no one here does stuff right. But yeah, there's plenty of Koei in Japan that are over 100 years old. They take it really darn serious over there. And, you know, like here, not so much. So as far as like how we do in the hobby with fish, we could always do better. Uh, Could a torch live 10 years or better? A torch should be immortal. It should live forever. All corals we keep should live forever. Uh, do you have any proven method to make discosoma to let go of the rock? That's tricky. No, not so much. Actually, yeah, I do. Uh, put the ro like hang the rock upside down like uh, discosoma don't like to be upside down for very long. They'll usually start to let go after a, a while. So flow and upside down might do the trick. Subscription, when do you make monthly or quarterly live coral boxes? Later, when I have more time to even think about it. But yeah, it's something that, that, that I might be playing with later. But right now, I have, I have a lot more basic things that need to get done. <laughs> Uh, Lil Reefer, Mr. Saltwater said that the AI Prime is great for budget tank. Is there possible a way to to use any blue and white LED strips for fairly cheap for an LPS and Softy tank? So here's where there, there's like stuff that works and then there's stuff that works like better. Most coral will survive just fine under most types of readily available devices these days. Okay. It's when you buy a certain coral and are unhappy with how it's coloring up in your tank for some reason. Is when you start to look at maybe it's the devices. And that's kind of where you know people make the recommendation to go with a higher price point light, like Radeon Pros, like ATI Sun Powers, that sort of thing, where they're hundreds of dollars more than like a $40 inexpensive LED fixture. It, it's going to be dictated by the animals in your tank more than anything. But it's not necessarily on the survivability end, it's more on the idealized color end of things. So, and especially with when you start to talk about um, corals that are highly variable in coloration. Oh, we started over. We're in overtime, guys. So once we uh, get into things like like Micromusa that change color like crazy, or or to some extent, scalemia, to a large extent, Acropora. Uh, every decision you make will impact their physical appearance. So, in, and none of those would necessarily die. Maybe the, the Acro might want more light, but it's not about survivability. It's like, you don't want a brown coral. You wanted a nice colorful coral that you had paid all this money for. And that's when you would be better served by a more capable, higher-end fixture. <laughs> Someone made an Instagram uh, clownfish post, and the fun fact was that a clownfish can live up to five years. Uh-huh. <laughs> Get better. Yeah, that fish also sees a vet once a year. That fish also probably is in a heated pond where the heating cost of that pond is more than a car. But yes. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about the Koei again. And why not? There should be fish vets. Especially if people are buying gem tangs for like $1,000 or whatever the heck. Yeah, if that thing is looking kind of bad, I want to be able to call a phone number and be like, hey, uh, come save my prized pet, please. Adam, thoughts on Chinese black boxes? Uh, not my thing. Uh, so they work. They'll work fine. So if, if, that's, if that's all that's in your budget and you want to keep coral, they will keep coral. Uh, where they're going to fall off, there might be some build quality issues, things of that sort. 
there are some things that I'll go super cheap with, like that's like cheap Chinese manufacturing. But I've always, um, I've always noticed the better alternative, and this is just a personal thing. I like to buy nicer things once rather than less nice things more frequently. And sometimes I just like to have nice equipment that's that's a, a, a pleasure to use rather than kind of like fight through garbage construction and, and, and garbage execution on certain things. So the alternative to that is I'm using really expensive T5 fixtures from Amazon. Are they good? They work. I swapped out the bulbs, put in you know, the German ATI bulbs. The fixtures themselves, they're starting to fall apart, but it's been two years now. It's been two years. And yeah, they they still work for the most part. Okay, give me, I'll continue the, the live share here for just a little bit longer, but I do need to run to the restroom. I've kind of extinguished this. So I will be right back. <laughs> I've always pronounced it koi, yeah. So I get into this all the time with my Midwestern friends here, okay? 100%, it is koi. Nobody from Japan will call it koi. <laughs> Third hot take of the day. Mike Garbrandt, I have two Orphic V2 LED bars, get a lot of growth, very affordable. Orphic, from everything that I've heard, does really well on the coral growth front. Uh, one of my friends who's been on my live show a couple times is Nathan. He has um, a V3 Orphic over his frag tank and he's very happy with it. He's going to be putting together a new, much larger system and he's planning on going with all Orphic on that. Uh, Ritish Varam was asking, what are some rare or fancy leather corals that one can buy today? Um, we don't personally offer a ton, but the, my, my favorites are the toadstools, toadstool leathers with a bright, long green polyps. Sometimes they're called like Japanese toadstool leathers, but yeah, it's that variety. Two, please. My my LFS has a thirteen year old clownfish. Nice. Nice on the nice on the age of the animal. Less so on the actual clownfish part. That thing must be so mean. Oh my gosh. Uh, let's see. How long? Uh, how long does it take to film one coral and change the light temperature? So Andreas, it's uh, it's a little over a minute, I would say, to do that filming. the The color temperature is a special effect. I've been I've been toying with that for every single live show. I tweak it slightly. I'm trying to get a very specific look, and I think that this one here might be my favorite so far. Sometimes, so there's like a lot of processing that has to happen. 
So there's the processing that the camera does. Then there is the processing that um, happens in my my editing software, wire, it, editing software Final Cut Pro, where I do all the overlays and all that stuff, do the stabilization, you know, create the color temperature timer and all that stuff. Then it goes into my broadcast software, which is Wirecast, and it gets further manipulated because it needs to be all then shrunken down into a streamable packet that we can then send to YouTube because it starts off as a gigantic file out of the camera and by the time that it gets into Wirecast, it's probably one-tenth the size. So then we broadcast it to YouTube, and then YouTube does its own magic to get it to something that you guys can stream on your phone or whatever. So there's a lot of different steps where the colors can get messed up. And what I've noticed is that YouTube sometimes changes how they deal with color. So sometimes I'm trying to, to make it a little bit punchier color-wise to kind of compensate for YouTube making it more drab looking. But then suddenly YouTube will make everything super like hot looking. And so my, my uh, editing here that was kind of making it punchier makes it look downright clown show stupid once it actually gets onto YouTube. So sometimes it's like this little balancing act that I have to play. But so far from everything that I can see, I'm pretty happy with how the colors have, have worked out on today's show. Chillaxing. Hey Than, have you ever thought of doing a video listing which different types of corals can grow next to each other and which will wipe each other out overnight? Uh, well, I, I think I handled the second part of that to some degree with this last video I did all about coral aggression. But the types of corals that can grow next to each other, that's an interesting one. I'm, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a note of that. It's not ideal, but at the same time, it is good to know. Uh, Aqua Splendor, I sold, yes, yeah, so a Moonfruit, sorry, before I get to Aqua Splendor, Moonfruit777 talking about like how he loves his clownfish, that's great. And also like George, a Coralfish 12G, like he, he loves his clownfish, I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> all these people with their clownfish. I sold a couple of coral and almost all of them were, were beginning, all, all of them were begging to get a piece of my Japanese toadstool. He's, ta he's taking over my aquarium and becoming a main piece, bought it for $60. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing piece. I don't even know how much I would sell one for now. Actually, I wasn't there when uh, a customer had come by and had to have one. And so we, do, we haven't propagated these things, so they're like big now. And we were probably, these things are like, like $100 an inch, probably. I don't even know at, at this point in time. And this thing is enormous, right? So none of these things are actually for sale. This guy insisted, had to have one, and we must have charged him like four figures for it. And I don't remember which one we sold him. It was, it was gone by the time that I even got out of my office here. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're crazy expensive. When we even sell them, which we haven't sold one of those things in a year, I don't think. We've been kind of waiting for aquariums to kind of be able to propagate and expand and Things are still delayed. But hopefully, hopefully, come uh, barbecue time, we'll at least have the aquariums here and in place. Uh, Phil Hart, did you have any Montipore Digitata in the sale? Yes, there were. Don't know what numbers they were, but we did have a few I did see. Ernie Wallace with a $10 live show appreciation. Thank you. Appreciate it, Ernie. It's too bad that you couldn't. Ernie, you were the one that couldn't make it to the barbecue, right? That's that's a shame that you couldn't make it. But uh, yeah, I do definitely appreciate the super chat. All right. Well, this is about a half hour of overtime. Um, I got to go now. <laughs> so I hope you all had a good time with me here. Um, I will quickly just do...
the quick shout out to the Patreon folks. Uh, don't forget to check out the link for um, the barbecue if you guys wanted to make a last minute uh, travel plan to come visit us. You can come hang out, see everybody else in chat. We need to get um, name tags for everybody though, because I think that it's going to be hard to even for for me to remember everybody's like names and faces first of all. But then it'd, it'd be cool just to say, oh, I remember that person that you're always in chat. And it'll be nice to you know to to see the online following that way, right? Okay, guys. I appreciate you, and uh, I don't have anything scheduled for next month yet, but we will get into it again, and uh, hopefully y'all saw all, all saw something that you liked on this show. Yeah, no ideas for the next video either, but we'll, we'll get there. Barbecue first. I, I got some planning to do, right? Okay, see y'all later.